esteemed members of the press and distinguished guests, a very good afternoon and welcome to the unveiling of an extraordinary advancement in patient safety by Dozy. Today, we are gathered here to witness the launch of the fall prevention alert feature, a groundbreaking innovation that promises to revolutionize patient safety in healthcare facilities across the globe. Before we proceed, allow me to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guests, without whom this would not be possible and where whose presence adds immense value to this occasion. Joining us today are Dr. Sandeep Reddy, consultant at MS Ramaya Hospital, Mr. Mudit Dalmante, CEO and co-founder of Dozi, and Mr. Gaurav Parchani, CTO and co-founder of Dozi. Their expertise and dedication have been instrumental in making this innovative solution a reality. Can we please have the video for the fall, fall prevention alert system? Thank you so much. To provide us with further insights into the significance of this innovation, we are privileged to have Dr. Sandeep Reddy, consultant at MS Ramaya Hospital with us today. Dr. Sandeep Reddy brings a wealth of experience and expertise in healthcare to the discussion, shedding light on the critical issue of patient falls within hospital settings and offers valuable insights into the potential impact of Dozy's fall prevention system, alert system feature. Can we please have Dr. Sandeep Reddy on stage to share a few words? Thank you so much. Uh, a very good morning. about eight to ten years I've been in the center of patient care and have closely watched the intricacies with patient safety uh, falls uh, among our within the hospital setting is it's not very uncommon we usually see and I have had the misfortune of uh, uh, being close to it uh, as an infectious disease uh, physician uh, I, my set of patients are for pneumonia, urinary tract infections. In the last one year, I've got about two of them, one with pneumonia and one with urinary tract infection. Almost the end of their hospital stay. And these patients are geriatric, elderly, high-risk population, about to go home, finished off their antibiotic course, and I get a call saying, they just had a fall in the restroom or getting off the bed slip uh, in the middle of the night, and I fast-track their diagnosis, their uh, evaluation by my orthopedic <coughs> team. I had one elderly gentleman uh, sharing their story is 
son is an army uh, air force officer three days down the line they've got the air force show they've got their tickets uh, coupons to attend the air show about to get discharged has a fall in the night in the restroom and have a fracture femur now what this is leading to is further hospital stay increased financial burden on my patients surgical interventions mental health uh, trauma morbidity risk and in case in another of my patient a head injury almost risking to the death so huge impact i mean we can throw down numbers saying about, about I, i can show some numbers about 1.5 to 2 million uh, cases of falls every year resulting in a staggering 50 to 60% of leading to injuries but for my patient it is 100% uh, I, I, these numbers don't matter to him or to his family i mean he had a fall he had his injury so it just becomes 100% now in this crisis now here comes a company born out of our country of our place hand holding us our team in trying to make sure we minimize such issues so that my patient go home when they were supposed to go home so now we've got the technology and they come with such advanced technology and with real time monitoring when it comes to monitoring as such and I'm very and happy that my sister and their in hyderabad and she's carrying expecting so now i'm going to be an uncle so proud of it do she is out there just a call to from either me or my mom assure her that everything is going to be fine we are not with her during such her important days so in similarly though i'm standing here with you guys my patients are assured that i am overlooking with them looking over that vital monitors seeing how it does just through the amazing technology that does dozy gives to me through an app or real time monitoring through my nurses to their <clears throat> consorts at their stations so it just becomes an assurance that such technology with real time monitoring can prevent uh, an important uh, 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 an issue that we've been facing over the years i think we've got some great exciting future i mean with technologies like this and more to come assurances from the company i'm sure uh, i think will be much relieved and saying that assurances that i can really assure my patient that that we we keeping an eye on you and that an best outcome that is being provided to my patients 24 bar 7 now when it comes to my nursing care now advantage what advantage does it bring to my nursing care now it is no simple i mean it is not i'm not going to sugar coat this now we do have uh, uh, a deficiency in the manpower support that we have that's been re- uh, prevalent across the countries across the country over every institution now my nurses are being overworked though they're not complaining they're still being overworked they got to look at the patient the vitals monitors listen to every patient or my family members queries even if the television remote is not working my nursing staff have been called to say not working so they've been overworked and i mean i've been thankful for them for doing this extra now with the dozy in the backdrop overlooking at the vitals now it just gives more time for my nursing staff to concentrate and what they are supposed to do what they do best that the patient care and safety so i think with the combination of the best manpower care that we provide and such amazing technologies that dozy gives us i i think the future is very bright and it is again with pride movement right? and again uh, with the vision of our prime minister made in india for us and for the world i i think now that we are entering in in into united states and planning for expansion in united kingdom and it's coming from our own place our own city and it is with immense pride and, and absolutely no regrets traveling across from ramaya through the bangalore traffic in the midday to stand here it should speak that we 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 are behind this and and i really thank the team for uh, for this journey i mean it's been a journey about 
one and one year, one and a half year with my hospital, and regret not regretting for even a second. And this is it's going to be great and lots of journeys together. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for your invaluable perspective. Your insights underscore the transformative potential of this technology in improving patient outcomes and streamlining clinical workflows. Now, let us hear from the visionaries behind this remarkable inno innovation. I invite Dr. Mudit Danwante, uh, Mr. M um, I stand corrected, Mr. Mudit Danwante, CEO and co-founder of Dozy, to share his thoughts on the significance of the fall prevention alert feature and its implications for the future of healthcare. Mr. Mudit, would you please come on stage and share a few words? Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. I don't think uh, much is left to be spoken after, you know, a uh, clinician of Stada, uh, Dr. Sandeep has spoken. I don't think, uh, you know, from a clinician lens, he has explained beautifully that, you know, why uh, something like fall prevention, uh, right, is so critical. Uh, we might think that, you know, falls happen or not happen, right? We, we really don't know the significance of that, right? Because we might not have seen that, but, you know, he sees that every day in his facility and he explained some, he uh, just, you know, quoted some anecdotes over there that, you know, how patients were at the end of their, you know, journey with the hospital, they have packed their bags, about to go home, and very unfortunate that, you know, it extended for no particular reason, right? Their stay was almost, uh, you know, over, over there, and they were, you know, supposed to go home, and they were, they had recovered. So as a clinician also, he had, you know, done everything what was needed to treat for what they had come to the hospital, but unfortunate that, you know, something like this happened and the stay extended, the cost extended. And, you know, the mental trauma that is caused to the patient and their families, right, are, of course, you know, uh, which are unparalleled over there. And it's such circumstances as, sir, you know, rightly mentioned. You know, nurses are looking after so many things that, you know, looking after every nitty gritty for so many patients might not be possible. And under such circumstances as technology providers if you know the thought was sim uh, simple that you know if we could do something to you know reduce their burden a bit uh, right and we could create a technology that can overlook each and every bed uh, right we can prevent uh, you know a good percentage of these uh, you know falls happening in the hospital which are unnecessary and you know no uh, human you know, hours are wasted on, you know, something which is, uh, you know, not required at all, right, to be existed. So that's, that's the background behind fall prevention, uh, right? Uh, how it works, Gaurav is going to talk about it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then I, I won't, uh, you know, into that. But, but thanks a lot, sir, for coming. Uh, I know, you know, what you mentioned coming through the Bangalore traffic. I know what you mean. Uh, and would really like to talk about you know the way we have also worked with sir and his entire team at ramaya as well right it has been almost one and a half years since we have very closely worked and developed the product also together in fact uh, the need for something like this right really comes from you know having a deep understanding of the market itself which you know happened through interactions like this just before uh, you know, talking, we were also exchanging few notes on how, you know, after this, what needs to be done. And uh, sir has already given us the roadmap for what is next as well, uh, right? So I'm sure, you know, this uh, fall prevention alert is going to, you know, create a big impact. But there are many more to come. And we are looking forward as a company to improve the patient safety much uh, more uh, in the hospitals, not just in India but all across the world as well, right? So thanks a lot for joining uh, this afternoon and looking forward to what Gaurav also says as well. So thanks. I would like to further invite uh, Mr. Gaurav to explain how the system works. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for giving us uh, so much direction and your uh, the the anecdotes that you gave, right, is the thing that motivates our team as well, and a good good amount of a good chunk of our team is here already. Uh, this is something that we build technology for. Similarly, 
the sensors that go and attach to the bed. Uh, in addition to our existing sensors that capture the micro vibrations of the body, uh, from where we get heart, respiration, blood pressure, non-contact blood pressure, we have another bit of sensors which is particularly specialized for uh, static load sensing, which essentially, in a very simple word, is sensing the there is significant amount of weight and combining it with the vibrations that I'm getting it uh, from the patient to determine what is the status of the patient right now. Are they lying down on the bed or they've just gotten up and they've now uh, going somewhere. Uh, now, we've, what we've essentially done is in real time, the system can recognize that the state has changed and then the patient from lying down and occupying the bed has gotten up and now moving out. And what we've also essentially done is combined this with a lot of software customizations on top of it, right? Not every patient is on the risk of bed fall. So it doesn't make sense for a 20-year-old who is admitted for, let's say, a no surgery or something like that, right? Uh, to activate this sort of feature for them because it's only going to increase the alarm fatigue because that patient is going to be ambulatory. But as you very rightly mentioned, uh, elderly patients, patients, let's say, with knee surgeries or ma many such patients which are on the risk of fall already, and particularly all patients during the night, for example, right, can go and attend to the patient and help them out. A lot of times we've seen uh, that especially elderly patients out of guilt because their family is there in the night, do not wake up their caretakers or do not, do not call the nurses. And this is where we can be a little bit more proactive uh, and be more human in our care is what we've tried to do. So that's, that's generally how the feature works with a lot of engineering, sensor engineering, and a lot of customization on the software side so that it can be usable in all settings. Uh, whether it's a tertiary hospital, whether it's a trunk prevent, all of them, at least uh, we're able to mitigate at least the 90 to 95% of these falls, but with the mission of zero falls. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mudit and Gaurav, for those inspiring remarks and detailed functioning of the product. Now, we would like to open the floor for questions from the media. Please raise your hand and our team will bring you a microphone. I invite all the speakers to join us on stage so that you guys can take the questions from the media. Do we have any questions? So can we close this, uh, the questionnaire round? Yeah, no question answers for today? OK. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for stepping up on stage. One to 22 amino acids, which has been present in veg and non-veg sources, will be uh, recommended for the patients so that they will be including in the diet. So that helps to improve the outcome. So coming on with the omega-3. So we all know omega-3 is a very important essential fatty acid, which uh, produces DHA levels. So if we say 1.3 grams is requirement and EPA DHA together is 300 mg per day. So if I look on to the values, if they take 250 grams of fatty fishes and contraindicated degree is we have to tell them that mercury content fish is to be avoided during lactation because that has direct impact with the neurocognitive development of the baby. So if they consume 250 grams of uh, marine fishes per day, that will actually help them to, per week, that will actually help them to meet up their DHA levels, which impacts the baby's growth and development. And next important point we say for the vegetarian, that is one of the major, uh, you know, a task which we have. So we have nuts and oily seeds which can be supplemented for them. So that will help, like walnuts, uh, flax seeds, chia seeds, these are high in omega-3. It has the precursor of linolenic acid and alpha-linolenic acid, which converts into um, this uh, DPA and EPA, okay, DHA and EPA. So looking on all these pointers, these were the sources that has been recommended. And coming on with the omega-3 impact for the baby, it shows that it is directly associated with the development of early immune system growth, with, which reduces the inflammatory disorders of the infant. And next, looking on to the growth and weight of the development, it's very higher. So these are the important pointers. Next. 
So coming on to the methodology. Uh, so it's a non-probability purposive sampling. Sample collected was 60 and analyzed were 47. So preterm babies mothers were included and this was the methodology. So first when we are going into the IP rounds, we usually uh, meet the preterm mothers, counsel them on the lactation diet, focusing mainly on protein, omega-3, EPA, DHA and we'll be handing over a diet chart with a detailed uh, description of the quantity and how much to be consumed per day. And after which hospital diet menu will be modified if they are staying in the hospital to take care of the preterm babies. If not, they'll be count, uh, they'll be going with their home with the diet shot and they will be follow up via call. And after that, weekly detailed follow up will be done via call or a dietary recall and modifications will be done and the improvement will be monitored on a weekly basis. And after that, follow up of mother and the baby will be done until discharge from the hospital or when the baby is, you know, until discharge from the hospital. Yeah, next. So this is the actually, yeah, thank you. Any questions to Ashita and team? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for that. So according to the results, the present study shows that the quality of protein intake is being improved 36.8 grams plus or minus 12.4 grams. And the quantity of the breast milk supply has been improved from 23.7 plus or minus 15 ml. So it shows that there is some improvement with the volume of breast milk and with the protein intake pre and post counseling. Weight gain of the baby is being monitored, but it differs because of the neonatal birth weight loss. Next slide. So this was the conclusion and it shows that it's a gradual improvement of milk output and infant weight gain changes, it's been monitored and challenges here is lacking and follow up post discharge by the mothers and we always suggest that after two weeks it's mandatory to meet a clinical dietitian or a nutritionist so that we can uh, prevent some of the other changes for the babies. Right? Thank you so much. A Dr. Harshita Verma. Harshita Verma, I'm so sorry. A very good evening to all. I'm Dr. Harshit Verma, and today I'm going to give the presentation on a study to rationalize, uh, a study to rationalize the healthcare record forms in use at trauma centers, so as to develop an evidence-based trauma registry algorithm and recommend a hospital-based trauma registry program framework in a tertiary care hospital in northern India. So, uh, first of all, to give a brief introduction about my study, as we all know that the trauma resulting from accidents, violence, or other incidents presents a significant burden on healthcare facilities and resources. To address this challenge, the implementation of hospital-based trauma registries has emerged as a crucial tool for collecting, analyzing, and utilizing data related to traumatic injuries. The objectives of the study were, first of, uh, first of the objective was to obtain and rationalize the healthcare, which are clinical and medical record forms in use at trauma centers, and to compare and identify the gaps, if any, with the parameters of pre-existing trauma registries. Second objective was to design appropriate trauma registry algorithm. And the third objective was to do the pilot testing of the trauma registry algorithm so as to recommend a standardized trauma registry protocol. The last objective was to recommend for the commissioning of hospital-based trauma registry program as a tool in policy making. So this study was conducted in uh, two of the premier institutes of Lucknow, which were Apex Trauma Center, SGPIMS, and KGMU Trauma Center. So for the fulfillment of the first objective, Healthcare record forms from these centers were examined and the uh, deficits were identified based on the selected objective elements from the existing literature. The objective el uh, elements which were listed were the patient demographics, injury event, pre-hospital information, investigation and diagnosis, quality indicator and patient care outcome. 
So now for the fulfillment of uh, uh, the second and third objective to uh, address these deficits and establish an efficient hospital based trauma registry program, a customized toolkit, which was a trauma registry pro uh, form, was developed. This was a three page, uh, this was a three page trauma registry form, which was developed, which is short, crisp and easy to fill. As we sought to, uh, as the information that we needed to sort was given in objective form rather than being subjective. So uh, now for the result, the, a total of 130 patient records were examined from pre-identified trauma centers for the pilot testing. I will brief about the results from the uh, graphs. Next. So as you can see, in the, uh, uh, in the cumulative study, the age distribution, the maximum trauma patients fall under the category of 21 to 30 years and 31 to 40 years. And the gender uh, distribution was in a ratio of 4 is to 1. That is, males are four times more prone to traumatic patient injuries. And as we uh, conclude to the type of case distribution, uh, out of 130 cases, 57 cases were from the KGMU trauma center, and the rest were the, from the Apex trauma center. Out of 57 cases, 45 cases were non-MLC and 12 were MLC. These uh, data, uh, ident uh, these data uh, basically defies that the 12 uh, uh, that the 12 cases that were uh, registered as MLC, which uh, directly came to the trauma center. Rest of the cases were either the referred sent, uh, either the referred cases or the uh, or the uh, non MLC cases, which were which were not uh, uh, trauma, uh, which were not uh, uh, accidental cases. So uh, in the uh, Place of injury. Most of the case, uh, most of the traumatic cases were either from the street highway. Sixty-five percent cases were from the street or highway. As we can see, that the main leading cause of injury was road traffic accidents, followed by the falls and the followed by blunt trauma. <clears throat> In the uh, sixty-five percent cases of the, uh, road traffic accidents, sixty-six percent were two uh, two-wheeler riders, followed by sixteen percent which were car riders. And out of these 66% of two wheelers, 38 cases were uh, uh, were those riders who were not wearing the helmet, and 17 cases were the on only uh, 17 cases were only that were wearing the helmet. And out of 16% of car accident cases, 10 were wearing the seat belts, uh, 10 were not wearing the seat belts, and only two were the wearing the seat belts. As from the distribution of referral cases, 46% cases that were referred to the trauma centers were from CHC followed by private hospital and to the nearby district hospital or government hospital. The mortality rate, as we can see that in the cases of road traffic accidents, 11 patients were succumbed to death and 71 were the survivors, followed by the fall, uh, fall patients in which 18 were the survivors and only one succumbed to death. In the discussion part, the study reveals that the majority of injuries occurred in the 21 to 30 age group, followed by 31 to 40. Consistent with finding in the other studies, highlighting the impact on the productive youth demographic. Road traffic incidents primarily involving motorbikes were the leading cause affecting males more than females. Non-use of helmets, that are 69% of cases among motorbike users, and seat belts, 83% among car users, was prevalent, aligning with the previous studies emphasizing protective gear benefits. The limitations of my study were, the study was conducted in two tertiary care uh, trauma centers that may not fully represent the diverse healthcare settings. The second limitation was that the study lacks exploration of the uh, socioeconomic status, influence on the healthcare service preference, emphasizing the need for future investigations to address these limitations. The, now for the recommendation, to establish an effective hospital-based trauma registry program, a multidisciplinary committee with clinicians, data scientists, informatics experts, and administrators is in process to be made. Specialized manpower in trauma care, including a trauma nurse coordinator, enhances coordination, and patient care is being recommended. To conclude, this study aspires to be a catalyst for transformative change by advocating for the establishment of an hospital-based trauma registry program which will act as a dynamic, comprehensive, and standardized repository for trauma-related data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harshit. Any questions? OK. Uh, Vignesh, who is next? Sorry. Uh, Dr. Mohammad uh, Zayauddin? Not here. OK. Uh, how about Lavanya? Hi. Yeah, sure. 
good evening all thank you for this opportunity and our study title is optimizing door to needle time in children with febrile neutropenia in the pediatric emergency a quality intervention study i am dr lavanya and i am happy to present on behalf of st john's medical college delay in administration of uh, antibiotic after 60 minutes of arrival to the pediatric emergency with the children on cancer chemotherapy causes a rapid deterioration and increases the mortality and the cost febrile neutropenia during the one chemo cycle is approximately 80% next so the it clearly states the qi initiatives identify and tackle factors causing delays in door to needle time and hence improves adherence rates and outcomes my pro primary objective being to determine the median door to needle time that is administration of antibiotic within the first 60 minutes and to improve the proportion of children with potential febrile neutropenia receiving timely antibiotics to 90% over 6 months by the implementation of qi and the secondary objectives being to identify factors associated with delay in antibiotic administration the inclusion criteria being children okay sorry our study design was a quasi experimental in a pediatric emergency of a tertiary care hospital uh, covering a duration of 2 years and the sampling method used was a non probability consecutive sampling and the calculated sample size was 171 so children aged between 1 month to 18 years on cancer chemotherapy with potential febrile neutropenia were included in my study and children who received antibiotics prior to 6 hours of arrival were excluded and the uh, definition of uh, febrile neutropenia is shown as below so the data collection started from june 22 to june 24 and the sustenance data that is from january is still ongoing and it included the demographics clinical features and the diagnosis and the door to needle time was documented from the arrival time in the er to the antibiotic administration time and the outcome variables like mortality picu stay and the duration of stay and the cost were documented a plan a pdsa cycle that is a plan do act cycle was done every 3 monthly to look for delay in antibiotic next and a fishbone analysis was done for a root cause effect as in to look why there is a delay in administration of antibiotics which is done through online feedback interviews and informal discussions and chart reviews so it is clear from our baseline data that the median door to needle time in our setup was 80 minutes and the percentage receiving antibiotic in the first hour was only 21% prior to the intervention and the fishbone analysis was done to look for the delay in door to needle time which identified various factors like training human factors infrastructure venous access and availability and policy being the factors which needs interventions and identified in detail are the various other factors which needs interventions and these were based on the root cause effect analysis and golden r is the key triaging of febrile neutropenia is essential waiting lab reports waiting for consults lack of multiple order execution policy poor access to chemo ports were other factors which were been identified as the cause for the intervention and which needs policy change what we did do in our setup was the training in the form of intensive lectures and simulations both for the nursing staff and for the doctors in the pediatric emergency and also to use a chemo port in the emergency at the bedside was practiced a clinical care pathway was created displayed and inserted at various places in the emergency for the ease of application and a rapid do documentation form and a checklist bundle was inserted in the patient bradma file for the ease of application a isolation cubicle for the children with febrile neutropenia was created and a chemo port trolley with all the things available for the accessing the chemo port was made available in the pediatric emergency for the child to get the timely antibiotic so our results were satisfying so comparing the baseline and the post intervention data we had totally 129 episodes with 92 children and as compared to the post uh, intervention we had 80 episodes covering of 64 children and the diagnosis being similar in the both the groups over 90% being hematolymphoid 
and other baseline parameters like median time since last chemotherapy, median duration of fever, and the percentage with chemo ports was comparable between the baseline and the post-intervention group. And we are happy to see that the percentage requiring ICU care dropped from 10% to 0%. And what was more gratifying was the median door to needle time slashed from 80 minutes to 40 minutes. And the percentage who required received antibiotics in the first hour went up from 21% to 96%. And the chemo put accessed was up to 100%. And the total cost difference was more than 15,000 in the pre and the post, and which was a significant for a child receiving cancer chemotherapy in our setup. So when we compared our studies with different groups from uh, other countries, we had an excellent sample size of 219. And when we had the proportion of uh, children receiving antibiotics went up to 96%, which is the maximum among the other groups. And the causes being multifactorial and the impact on outcome, which is not analyzed in other groups, we had achieving the golden hour and reduction of cost was significant. And QI strategy achieving 95% adherence to target door to needle time, which was just 80% and 88% in other groups. So in conclusion, I would conclude that the uh, improvement in proportion of febrile neutropenia receiving antibiotics within an hour of arrival went up to 96% and the identification of multiple factors as uh, root cause delays and the intervention leading to significant outcomes that is at achieving a golden hour up to 96% and adherence rates up to uh, target the door to needle time slashing from 40, 80 minutes to 40 minutes and the reduction of cost up to 34%. These are my references. And, uh, I, and uh, I'll acknowledge my, all my kids. And there is a QR code to access to our clinical care pathway and the check, checklist bundle, which we have made it for ease of application. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lavanya. Any questions to Dr. Lavanya? The sample size that you said about 200 and mm -hmm. odd was all from the ER. Yes, sir. The it children who presented children with, 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 with febrile episodes. Yeah, neutropenia yeah. within the yes, ER. Yes, sir. Great outcomes. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, next presenter, Narsimaya Srinivasaya. Dr. Narsimaya. My bad. Good evening. It's never easy to be the last speaker on a, is it Friday? Friday evening. Friday. Evening. Right. Lovely. Okay. See, we're all obsessed with a lot of protocols, policies, guidelines, and World Health Organization or the WHO checklist is one of them. Sometimes too much of perfection causes trouble too. So this was just a snapshot audit we concluded from a study we did under Apollo Hospitals. Next slide, please. I don't need to take you through what are the problems, what are the complications that happen if you do not follow checklists. Next slide, please. So I think we all know who checklist is a 19 item checklist. You know, there are three components to it. Next slide, please. So this is what we do, especially as a surgeon. We go through these three components very vigorously, very religiously. You know, before induction we do, before skin incision we do, and just before the patient leaves the operating room we do. Next slide, please. So this is called a sign-in, time-out, and sign-out, respectively. So one is to prevent, you know, wrong site operating, wrong patient operating, surgical site infection reduction, DVT reduction, so on and so forth. This is all from the airline industry, from Atul Gawande's work. So we wanted to check the surgical safety checklist, how it is implemented in our setup at Banagatta Road. So we essentially took two 20 surgeries that were performed. You know, this was for a period in 2022, both elective and emergencies, and we looked for the case files. Next slide, please. So such a simple thing, out of 20 emergencies were two and electives were 18. Next slide, please. So if you actually look at it, everybody completed the sign-in. Time out, only 80%. Why is that? Is it not important? Fully completed sign out again. So 20% did not do the two vital processes. So one in five, which is fair bit, and mistakes can happen here. Next slide, please. 
So when we looked at time out, intraop glycemic monitoring in diabetic patients was missed out in quite a few patients. But you know, diabetic patients intraop monitoring is very important, surgical site infections, cardiac events, so on and so forth. Again, look at that, instrument sponge needle count, missed in 1 in 20 cases. So very important. So despite us being very religious and perfectionist, there are still things that we don't do properly. Look at this. Name inside of specimens. Confirmed labeling center lab. Missed in three cases. Missed in three cases. So something we think is 100% and taken for granted is not happening properly. Next slide, please. So what I'm trying to get to is, until and unless we religiously do these things to perfection, mistakes can still happen. This is what they did in Australia and Canada, looking at who checklists, and did they, they looked at it and they said, is it good or bad? And if not done properly, it's actually more hazardous, more troublesome, and more dangerous to the patient, so to say. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is, we create guidelines, we create checklists to help us but if somebody does not take the responsibility, the ownership, and do it properly, mistakes can happen. And a typical Swiss cheese effect is something that we can see in these patients. So I think patient at the heart of what we care for, these are important. Nevertheless, never let your guard down. Keep the ownership of the patient. Be a patient advocate. And you stand up for something if you think things are not going right. With that, I'll stop my talk. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello. He said uh, point number two and point number three yeah. about a week. Eighty percent is the compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Did we go into details of what no. is the reason for the not being hundred percent compliant, know. despite being a mandatory uh, requirement of the hospital in the UR? So these typically happen when a time when nursing colleagues change and surgeons don't take too much of an attention to what is going on. See, the ownership should be taken by the clinician and the head of the anesthetics and the team as a whole. But what happens is, and then the mods. This is complacency. So complacency is one of the key factors. And training, see, we all have nurse educators with us. The problem is, you know, training the trainers is important. The nurse educators come in, but they have to be trained how to deliver this. And we don't, we never keep up with the audit cycle. You know, we're very good three months before JCI, we do everything. But after that, we forget about things. So looking at the root cause analysis when we did it, one was complacency, two was changing in the nurses, the period when we have lack of nurses. And three, there's a lack of response with the clinicians as well. Because look at that specimen was not sent because it was discarded, because nobody asked for it. So likewise, these are small things. Communication is one thing. And doing these three components very religiously is important. So when you do a, a timeout, we always say, patient identified, yes. Is the name written, yes. Is the band checked, yes. OK? Any antibiotics given, yes. Is it ticked? What risks are there? What? So I think we have to run it in a very religious way. Unfortunately, we do it as a tick box business. And that's the problem. And that's what happened with Canada and Australia. They said, if you don't do it properly, you actually cause more harm to the patient. So it is there to help us, guide us. But I think somebody should take the ownership, the responsibility, and do it in a proper way. So I think it need not be the who checklist. But whatever vital components you have to be done, it can be called as something else. But it has to be done in a methodical way. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Hello. Uh, who is not here? Is he here? Uh, Mohammed is here. Mr. Mohammed? No, right? I request uh, Uday sir to present a certificate of participation to Dr. Narsim Haya. Thank you, sir. Dr. Harshit. Thank you. 
डॉक्टर लावण्या हर्षिता एंड अभिलाषा ओ सॉरी हरी प्रिया माई बैड गुड इट्स नॉट अ वीडियो Thank you and congratulations to all the presenters. Uh, sir, you would like to say anything in general to all the presenters? I think it was very important and uh, <clears throat> very well covered by everybody as to what is the applicability. I'll have to take a minute to give it back to you. Yeah. Uh, applicability was something very, very important. I think uh, we looked at all the areas and if you really look at this comes from the neonatology and the mother, the other side it comes on the trauma. And the, the third presenter was on the, chemo, uh, on the chemo side, especially the neutropenia. And uh, Dr. Narasimhaya presented on the checklist. So I think these are very important things. Uh, if we really look at it on our daily life, while we are at the hospitals, at the healthcare provider side, I think this can make a big difference to patient safety and patient well-being. So very well uh, presented by all the presenters here. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
uh, in Dozy. Dozy is a contactless remote.